Boise. Um, some of you know, uh, I moved here about six plus years ago from the Bay Area. And the story has been talked about a lot, why Trey McIntyre Project chose Boise. And it's interesting because even though I haven't been in Boise for the past couple months working in Chicago, I get asked that question every day still. Why Boise? People always want to know why a community of this size would have lured a dance company to come, and more so, why did we become the city's economic development cultural ambassador? In the six years that I've lived here, I've met many of you in this room. Yesterday, I went and got my tooth fixed by my dentist, and then I went, biked down, got my hair cut at Graber, biked around town, had some time to go in my backyard, laid on my hammock, come back downtown, meet with the Tree Fort gang, bike back home, then go down to Tony Doerr's book reading at the Linen Building, where I saw my dentist and my hairstylist. <laughs> and most of the people in this town that I know and love best. And that really encapsulates a lot of what this community is about. I don't have an easy answer anymore for why we chose Boise six plus years ago, because it's become more complicated. This question of why becomes more rich every time I tell the story. And I try not to use hyperbole, but people always think I am. People think I'm telling a story that's not true. This little, you know, Camelot in the mountain west, that was able to uh, support a world-class arts organization. And then I have to remind people, especially other people you know, out in the world who readily confuse Idaho with Iowa, <laughs> that there is a wealth of generosity in this community of Boise. We might not have the spending power that communities like Chicago and San Francisco have, but if you look at the spirit of generosity and inclusion and volunteerism that happens here in Boise, Idaho, I'm constantly astounded. I've lived now in New York and San Francisco and Chicago. I've traveled the world. I've been in communities. I've witnessed philanthropy at the highest level with people with you know, unlimited assets. I've also witnessed it at the poorest levels where I grew up in South Georgia, where people are just struggling to, to truly live in a very impoverished region. And I'm always astounded by how this community continues to support at such a high level the many, many, many things that are happening here. So I wanted to talk today about the why again. Why Boise? I still make my home here. This is where I want to live. Work is taking me to Chicago and New York and other places. And people keep asking, well, how long before you leave Boise? And I keep thinking about the why of it. Why am I here? Since I transitioned out of Trey McIntyre Project almost a year ago, I thought a lot about this, this city. And I thought a lot about the reasons that I chose to live here six years ago and the reasons I now choose to be here. It has a lot to do with a community that nurtures and supports not just the, the, the product of what we're all creating, but the process. I've been thinking a lot about what that process is. Last night, Tony Doerr said it pretty beautifully in the question and answer session following his reading. Someone was asking about, um, you know, what are your favorite books or what are your favorite stories? And he was illuminating that this book is the product and it's great, but the art is not the book. The art is the process. The art is how you make the things you make, how you go about living your life how you wake up every day and think about how you want to feel, how you want to interact with the world around you, the people that you want to interact with. My dad, one of my you know, living heroes, since the moment I was born, has always said, know who you are, know what you want, know where you're going, and know who's going with you. And I think about that all the time, because without knowing it, or, you know, you take on so much of what your parents taught you or gave you, good and bad. But the good parts, especially, we chose Boise because back in 2008, Trey and the board and our community of supporters, we knew who we were, we knew what we wanted, we knew where we were going, and we needed to know who was going with us. And we chose Boise, Idaho. It's so funny, in hindsight, we knew all the reasons, but we didn't know them. We couldn't articulate it six years ago. But as I look back, they all came true in, in greater ways than we ever imagined. 
This community came with us everywhere we went. We traveled the world touring over 40 cities a year, and Boise came with us, literally and figuratively. Many of you in this room came, Debbie Wachtel came to the Hollywood Bowl, Carla's followed us around the United States. You know, all these TMP family members who not just came and witnessed the performances at the Morrison Center or saw us spontaneously start dancing next to you at a restaurant during lunchtime, but many of you literally came to New York, to Lincoln Center, to the Wolf Trap. Some of you even came to China with us. But more than that, we brought Boise everywhere we went. Uh, flashback to 2010, I had been having meetings with uh, the mayor and members of the city council about, about TMP being out in the world, and I sort of very uh, boldly brought in a stack of press this high, and I had flagged every mention of Boise and Idaho. Uh, and these were you know, papers from around the world. And I was saying, we want to do more to promote this community. We want to do more to help this community. And as you may recall, this was uh, 2010, there was a recession, and economic development was all the rage. And the mayor and city council said, well, we've got a little bit of economic development money, we'd like to appropriate it. And we began talk, having the conversation about how best to use that money. And through a very you know, collaborative effort with a lot of people involved, we said, what if that money went towards arts organizations that are doing economic development work, that are proving and showing the work that they're doing to not just be entertainers or to beautify, and there's nothing wrong with being an entertainer or beautifying, but in terms of being an artist, how are you of value to your community? Since it was 2010, we stated value in terms of economic development. That was a very somewhat clean and easy way to show worth. We live in a free market capitalist world. I'm very aware of that now that I work at Chicago Booth, which is, uh, you know, some would say where free market capitalism was invented. So we began to state our value in terms of number of seats sold, number of hotel rooms, beds and heads, how many people went out to dinner before and after a performance, parking. So all the nonprofits in town filed their grant application, and many of us received $20,000, $25,000 grants. It was a big deal at the time. Again, remember, recession, 2010. Most cities across America had completely cut their arts budgets, and here the city of Boise was pulling much-needed economic development dollars and investing it in its arts organizations. As far as I can tell, and I've asked around a lot, it's the only example of a civic government raising its arts funding during that recessionary period. At the tail end of the recessionary period, others did, and arts programs started to rebound. But in 2010, nobody was doing that. And so the, I got a message, I think, from Terry Shoresman at the Department of Arts and History, and she said, we need you to come to a, a city council meeting you know, it's just a perfunctory thing. They need to have you just agree that you accept these funds from the city. So I didn't really think much of it. They were like, yeah, yeah, bring some people from TMP. I think I brought Rich Ramondi. Rich might be in the room. He was a board member. I said, yeah, come with me. They, they need us to do something. Well, I, what I didn't know was that they would name Trey McIntyre Project the first ever City of Boise Economic Development Cultural Ambassador. It's a long title. <laughs> but I, I think it was uh, one of the most emotional moments for me We'd been here about two, two and a half years. We were a startup. We had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> we acted like we did, but we really didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we were completely new to this community. We also had a network of supporters nationwide, and we were traveling the world. We were literally burning the candle at four ends. You know, Many of you who were there with us in the beginning remember just how fervent and fevered and exciting it was, and how tiring it was. And it was a moment of sitting there as the mayor and city council, one at a time, illuminated out loud the impact that Trey McIntyre Project had had on the city and on them personally in the two years we've been here. And it was a really weepy moment for me because I hadn't really stopped to think about it. What was the impact we were making? So when I now think back on why we chose Boise six years ago, a word I often use is impact. We didn't know it, but we knew, we somehow intuitively knew that we could make an impact in this community. We could be a value to this community. And not by showing up and saying, you know, come to our show, we're, we're great entertainers, it's high caliber. Yeah, that was all there, sure. But it was really about how do we, as artists, as creatives, not just be on the periphery of society, but be of great value. How do we be citizens? 
How do we engage with our community and not just beautify and, and, and make it a little bit better place to live, but how do we really get in on the ground floor and into the fabric of a community and help grow a city? How do we help think about the needs of a city and a community and develop them in a way that is relationship-based, not top-down, not just slapping some money on something and creating a new initiative or a program. Again, I, I uh, can't say too much, but I work in a big city now <laughs> where it's easier for them to throw money at something. And they do a good job with their civic programs, but the more I get ingrained in Chicago, the more I also miss the way things happen here in Boise. The majority of you in this room work for nonprofits. I'm speaking to the choir. You understand what it is every day to be involved in the fabric of your community. Many of you are social service organizations. You're providing a much needed service. You're helping a underprivileged or undernoticed or just flat out not noticed segment of our population. You know, be in the WCA or helping women and families. Arts organizations like the Phil, the Ballet, the Opera, BCT, Shakespeare, and new ones like Momenta, my friend Anna and Jason are launching, are trying to bring world-class visual artists here to Boise. People are doing things in this community because they want to. So people ask me now a lot, why are you in Boise? And I, my, my glib answer is because I want to be. I want to be here. I think that astounds a lot of people in, in my new city because they think, well, why? You know, Chicago's better. <laughs> but they don't say it, but they think it. <laughs> and I think a lot about why I'm here and why I continue to want to be here. And I think back on that moment, February 2008, when I moved here, still driving that same silver Prius that I picked up February 1. I'm still living in the North End. I'm still going to get my hair cut at Graeber. No one's touched my head in six years except for Odell England. <laughs> and I think about the relationships that are here and the people. I walked in this room this morning and I could have sat and chatted for the next two hours and completely skipped this presentation because the people in this community are, are my family. I made, you know, I'm in the middle of a residency period in Chicago right now and I'll talk more about that in a moment. And months ago, I planned to be here this weekend. And it wasn't even to do this presentation. It was just serendipitous when Shauna, and I want to hugely thank Bank of the Cascades for making this breakfast happen. I think it's a beautiful moment to really honor the nonprofits in our midst and also to talk about this value that I'm hoping to illuminate today. But Shauna approached me and I said, well, I'm already planning on being in Boise this weekend. And I planned it that way because I knew I would be in Chicago for about five weeks. And I just somehow knew, in the same sort of, I guess, intuitive sense, same reason we chose Boise in the first place, I knew I would need to be back with my people. I needed just to come and be with people who know me. And I mean, know you. You know, again, biking around town, the number of people that wave, the number of people that shout out your name, because this is just a community where you still do that. Landing at the airport on Friday, I, you know, I knew five people on the plane. And then driving down Vista, in my silver Prius, I'm driving next to Decker and Jessica Roth, and we're waving at each other. And, you know, those are the communities that matter. Those are the relationships that matter in a community like this. After nine years at the helm of Trey McIntyre Project, I knew it was time for me to transition. I knew I was ready to take some of these ideas that we had developed here in Boise and see if they really stood up in other communities and in other environments. I didn't know what I was hoping or wanting to do. I was being offered some really extraordinary jobs to go run arts organizations around the United States and in Europe. And I knew I wasn't ready to go embrace a new community. I knew I wasn't ready to leave this community. To run an arts organization, in my opinion, to run any nonprofit, requires it to be your life. It requires you to believe so fully and not so much the product, but the process. The process of how you live, the process of how you interact with not just your staff and your artists or your talent or the people that you're serving, but the community. The best nonprofit directors, and you're in this room, 
Know that. Your job never ends. You never stop thinking about the people you're serving. If you're doing your job well, you're always connecting potential funding to that mission. <coughs> Someone said to me yesterday that they didn't like philanthropy or law nonprofits spend more time trying to raise money than they do carrying out their programs. And that, that, sadly, that is true of some nonprofits. But the good ones, the best, understand if you really create something of value and you find ways of communicating that with love and honesty and openness and vulnerability, it brings not just funding, it brings relationships. The founding board chair of Trey McIntyre Project is my second mother. I love the woman, Jody Peck, who hails from Milwaukee and Fort Lauderdale and chaired TMP for the first seven years. She said, always ask for advocacy, always ask for advice, genuinely. Really ask someone for advice, and you will get the advice, and you'll get the relationship, and you'll probably get the money. Ask someone for money, and you pretty much get the money sometimes. What I find about Boise is we moved here six years ago, and we asked for the, we asked for the advice. I met with a lot of you in this room. Jim Everett was one of the first people we met December 2007. We were doing a feasibility study, I guess you could call it, loosely. We were traveling to about 10 plus cities around America where Trey had a relationship and we were trying to determine where to base Trey McIntyre Project. It's an international touring company. We, were going to be, we knew we had income coming in from other states and from touring. So we had the luxury of saying, where do we want to live? That's a really rare question to get to ask yourself. You know, where, what do you want? Because <laughs> we all know what we should do, right? We know what we should do. We know what we could do. We know we could move to any of those cities. We know we probably should have moved to Houston because we would have gotten a lot more money. We knew we should have moved to San Francisco because we were offered a very large seed grant from a local foundation. Those were the shoulds and the coulds. What do you want? It's a really tough question. It's a question I asked myself a lot this past summer. But we got to Boise in December 2007. We had already been here, if some of you recall, summers 2005, 2006, 2007, in large part due to, again, many of you in this room, John Swarth out from Trica, and Trey went to high school together in North Carolina. And in our first summer, as a little pickup company, we were in Vail and Aspen, and then we had a week off, and we had to then be in the Berkshires of Massachusetts and we had nowhere to go. We couldn't send you know, 15 people home. One of them had to go back to Amsterdam, Washington, D.C., and it wasn't really feasible. And John said in 2004, when we were doing all this planning, why don't you come to Boise? Never been, never even really thought about it. I remember landing at the Boise airport, this was summer 2005, and John pulled up in a yellow school bus that he had borrowed from like Longfellow or something. <laughs> Again, very Boise. <laughs> and we piled in and he had lined up homes for us to stay and many of the dancers stayed and uh, I stayed with John and it was a matching little Victorian that was built in 1895 that father and son had built these two, John owns one, there's one next door and most of the female dancers in the company stayed in that Victorian which is now the house I live in and we arrived in 2005 and we came back in 2006 and in 2007 uh, Carla was Bart Bodner was the director of the Valley Idaho, she was executive director, and the Valley Idaho board brought us to perform right here on this campus at the Spec Center. And as I showed up today to get my mic on, Steve, who's over in the booth, like, it's been a while, I haven't seen you in some time. Again, so Boise. I met this guy in 2006. In, 2000, in December 2007, as we were going through this feasibility study, Boise was always on, our, on the back of our mind. Because we were doing what any startup business does, we were paying attention to the coulds and the shoulds. Where should we go? And where could we go? Where's the possibility? Trey at the time had been the resident choreographer in five different companies across the US. We had these built-in audience bases and patron bases. You know, we knew we could sell a lot of tickets if we were based in Washington, DC. We knew we could raise a lot of individual gifts if we were in Houston. We knew we could raise a lot of institutional gifts if we were in Seattle or San Francisco. We asked ourselves the question of what do we really want? And back to Jim Everett, we, everyone of course, all roads lead to Jim, right? 
and we went to visit Jim at the downtown Y, and we talked about our vision and what we were hoping to do and what we thought we wanted to do, because again, we, didn't, we really didn't know what we were doing, we were just making it up as we went. And Jim said, this is just so synergetic, and he kept saying that word repeatedly, synergy. And to illuminate the fact that it was so synergetic, we're walking out of the YMCA, December 2007, and Jim had kept saying, well, we need to get you in with the mayor. This was like a Thursday night, the next day was Friday, and I think we were flying out Friday night. As we're walking out, Teresa McLeod's walking in. At the time, she worked for the mayor, and Jim said, Teresa, can you get them in with the mayor tomorrow? She said, of course. <laughs> and the next day, we met with the mayor. And that night, we unofficially made the decision to move to Boise, Idaho. We also did one of the smarter things, which is we had dinner at Lonnie Shumsky's house and asked her to join our board. And we said, Lonnie, even if we don't move to Boise, we want you on our board of directors. To this day, Lonnie's still on the board of directors of Trey McIntyre Project. Those relationships led us here. The mayor didn't promise us money. Jim didn't say, although we did try to be based in, in, a, in a YMCA. We did talk about being in the home court Y for a while. And we had a lot of you know, grand schemes. But Jim wasn't like, yeah, we'll give you a space and money. And the mayor didn't say, we're going to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars. And no one in this community stepped up and said, we're going to give you tens of thousands of dollars. But they all offered their advice, and they all offered their love, and they all offered a relationship. And we knew it would be financially, maybe not the right decision, quote unquote right, but we made the decision of what we wanted. We wanted to be a part of a place that upholds the sense of possibility, the sense of involvement, the sense of generosity, the spirit of generosity. So fast forward six years, I'm now working at University of Chicago Booth School of Business. This is uh, ironic. This is not a place that thinks of artists or of creatives as valuable. This is not a place that thinks of nonprofits as valuable. I was brought in by a man named Harry Davis, who is, you know, as you move through life, you develop these circle of mentors. In different phases of your life, you have this sort of primary person that guides you, and Harry is that person for me now. He's been at the University of Chicago Blue School of Business for 50 years, 5-0. He was hired by George Schultz, who later was the Secretary of State of the United States of America. And he just celebrated his 50th year there. Harry's an enigma. If you know anything about academic structures, or, you know, to get tenure is a big deal, and then you're guaranteed for life that you have a job. Terry, uh, Harry received tenure, obviously, 45 years ago. And I mean, I'll say, I think if Harry was a young guy now, he probably wouldn't get tenure because he's not competing in the way that you're supposed to. He's not writing academic papers. He's not competing for Nobel Prizes. He's not trying to win the Clark Medal. Harry cares about relationships, and he works in a highly quantitative free market capitalist business school. I met Harry November 2000, what was that, 12, 13. 12, when I was starting to plan my transition out of Trey McIntyre Project. And through this very weird and interesting set of conversations, and as I mentioned before, I didn't know what I wanted when I was leaving TMP. I, I hadn't thought it through in the same way we hadn't really thought through what we wanted to do in moving to Boise, Idaho. I didn't know where I wanted to go. I knew that I didn't want a lot of the jobs that were being offered. I wasn't ready to go accept a new community. I wasn't wanting to go and run some massive institutional organization. I didn't want to you know, run the Kennedy Center or run another dance company or an opera company. People kept wanting me to do what I should do. And people kept offering me jobs that I could do, perhaps, with a lot of growth and a lot of more mentorship. I could maybe do some of these jobs. I had to ask myself that same question, what do you want? And I took a four-month sabbatical. I spent a lot of it here in Boise last summer. I traveled the world and went and visited every one of my 17 cousins. I went to Barcelona by myself for my birthday. I love to travel alone internationally. And I was planning on being there alone. But of course, Bill to Spill was playing that night in Barcelona. So I had to go hang out with Eric Gilbert and the Tree Fork team. And then I took my mom to Tuscany, which was really one of the most lovely events of my life. 
and then I returned and I had to fly back to San Francisco and give a presentation at the California Cities Conference, which was a conference of mayors. And I had been on a sabbatical for four months. I hadn't really gathered my thoughts. I didn't really know what I was going to say. And this job at Chicago wasn't, at that point, concrete. I don't think it was contracted, like it wasn't a done deal. And I was talking about this idea of the utility of the creative process. I didn't even really know what that meant. I was sort of throwing some words around that I'd heard, you know? <laughs> utility, what does that mean? Utility, according to economists, you know, it's something that can be bought and sold, traded. It has value because it's of great utility. It's, it's, it's necessary. So the utility of the creative process to many people seems a little bit like an oxymoron. It doesn't really make sense. How do you suss out what this creative process is? I met this man, Harry Davis, who's made a life now out of process. He builds relationships. He's an educator, which you would think at an academic institution, everyone should be an educator, right? Well, it turns out at the University of Chicago, 90% of the faculty don't teach. You know, they're, they're doing research. They're winning Nobel Prizes. They're not teaching. And Harry's someone that has dedicated his life to building relationships and talking about what we've historically called the soft skills. <laughs> And I ran this idea of the utility of the creative process by Harry. And he said, I think I want you to come work with me. And there's no position, but let's make one. And having been there 50 years, I think Harry gets to do what he wants. And so they created a salaried position for me. So now I'm the first ever visiting artist and social entrepreneur at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. And that was interesting also because, sure, yeah, I'm an artist. I never called myself a social entrepreneur. And they said, well, of course you are. You launched a successful nonprofit business that was of great impact to your community. And I started to think a lot about, so what is social impact? And again, I work in a business school now, so I'm learning a lot about social impact. I'm technically housed in the Social Enterprise Initiative, which is looking at how we affect change in our community, mainly through investment, that's how they're looking at it, or startups, social impact startups. There's no difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit when you're talking about social impact. There's no difference between, that, that's a little bit semantics and process of, of, yeah, sure, how does the money come in and go out? The idea, it's so funny because I, I, I teach now, I lecture, I judge these presentations, social new venture challenge groups where students, these are MBAs, organize a new startup with social impact and implications and then they present and we judge and the winning team I think it's $50,000. So it's a you know, big deal and I'm a judge on these panels. And it's so funny, some of the ideas that come up that affect the room, people think, oh, this is groundbreaking, this idea of reaching people and how you're integrating with your community. I just think, that's what nonprofits do every day. <laughs> Being of value to a group of people and providing a service and helping them change their lives. And I just have to sort of raise my hand as we're at the judging table and say to you know, the CEO of some international finance group, that's what nonprofits do every day. There's a lot in the zeitgeist right now, bubbling up around these ideas. Um, Ariana Huffington's talking a lot about the third metric. People are talking about triple bottom lines. I'm sure some of you have heard these things. It's not just about profit anymore. It's also not just about doing good in your community. It's also about environmentalism. It's also about uh, decision-making screens. So I'm learning about things when a lot of people are making a decision, they first apply a negative screen to their decision, right? They think of all the things they don't want, which is sort of what I did when I was leaving TMP. I knew I didn't want certain jobs. And then usually the second phase is you apply a positive screen. You think about what you want. And then the third screen is you think about the impact your decisions can make. These social impacts and social investing are about being of value. So I thought a lot about the utility of the creative process. I choose to be in Boise because there's organizations here that I want to now volunteer for and help. So since I left TMP, I helped produce a tech conference called Hackfort that happened during Treefort. 
Mary was there with me in the trenches making this happen, and some of you in this room I went and asked to help fund it. Because I think it's important that we keep growing creatively the tech community in Boise. But also I wanted to support Tree Fort. How many of you went to Tree Fort over the past three years? It's good, it's about half. How many of you supported uh, Boise Bicycle Project during Idaho Gives a couple days ago? How many of you supported any nonprofit during Idaho Gives a couple days ago? Should be everybody in this room, right? I was in Chicago, Jimmy Halliburton, who runs Boise Bicycle Projects, a good friend, and the, the energy that he was generating on social media was palpable, right? I don't know if you know what he did and what BBP did. In 24 hours, they delivered 24 bikes to 24 kids, and that required 600 donations. He raised 600 donations. 400 separate donors, 600 donations. He did it not by... He did it by leveraging relationships. Every bike was dropped off at a participating business. Drake Cooper, uh, Graber Hair Salon, Oliver Russell, different businesses that had relationships with BBP. And the bikes sat there, and they were preordained that they were going to be delivered to a certain kid. This child had already written in saying that they wanted a specific bike that Jimmy and his team had found. Remember, these were all donated or reused bikes, and they had fixed it up with the right colors and the right pom-poms and the right everything. <laughs> And then they went and dropped it off at this participating business. And then every hour, if they had received the right number of donations, they would go pick up that bike on bikes, put it in a trailer, and then drive it to their next location to drop it off for that child. It was, it's incredible that they raised 600 donations. What's more incredible is just... The, the brilliance and the creative process that Jimmy put himself through. He, he, they, he and his partner Cass biked 100 miles. When I went in to get my haircut yesterday with Odell, he said, they smelled really bad when they <laughs> <laughs> But that was kind of the fun of it. And Jimmy said that people would be driving past them on, the, you know, on Vista or on Idaho and the new bike lanes, which I'm in full support of, the buffered bike lanes, and just honking and waving and, and you know, who knew who they were, knew what they were doing, and just complete strangers screaming out, I donated, you know, I, I support this. I support this in my community. I support a uh, small bike nonprofit. They're not just a bike nonprofit, right? They're not just delivering bikes to needy kids and teaching bike safety. They're, they're, they're teaching us of a new way of being, a new way of operating. They're teaching us how to have these significant relationships in our community. And I was, so I was teaching a course at, Booth's, at Chicago Booth, and I, this was happening, it was May 1, Idaho Gibbs, and I brought it up on the screens and showed them what was happening, and we did a case study on Boise Bicycle Project. And this blew their mind. These are MBAs that are probably going to go in their starting year out of school, and most of them will be making $150,000, and probably all of them will be making a million dollars within three to four years, because they're going to work for Bain Capital and McKinsey. These are high-powered people, high-powered in the sense that they will someday wield a lot of money and power. They were so impressed with what's happened with old Boise, Idaho, you know, in their minds, because the community cared. And Jimmy and Boise Bicycle Project care to the degree that they were putting themselves out there and building these unique relationships that will now sustain them for years. It's not easy. It takes a lot of work to manage these relationships, to keep developing them over time, to keep going back and asking people to support you, to show up. I always say the hardest thing, the hardest thing is getting people to show up. How many of you host events fundraisers, put on performances. People always thought, oh, T and PR is so great, the shows are always sold out. I'm like, do you know how hard we work <laughs> to get them sold out? You know, Jane Nalen, the company's former brand manager, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't just you, you put it up on stage and you build it, they will come. It was relationships. It was constantly thinking about the why. So what is the utility of the creative process? What is the creative process separate from the product? Because when I throw that out there, the first thing a lot of MBAs say is, well, if you make a film, as Zach Voss is making a film here in Boise, Idaho, right? Zach's an independent filmmaker who's making 
a feature-length film in Boise. Zach, are there any others happening right now in Boise? Any other feature-length films? Yeah. When was the last feature-length film made in Boise? I'm not sure. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not incentivizing Zach to do this. The state is not giving him money, well, a little bit of money, but, you know, there's not, like, major tax credits, and we're not, we don't have this thriving film industry that Zach's tapping into. He's choosing to be here. He's, he's incredibly talented. He's a graduate, product of BSU. He could be moving to L.A., New York, anywhere right now. But he's launching a feature-length film in Boise, Idaho. It's going to require anywhere from a quarter to a half million dollars. Which again, when I throw that number out with MBAs, they think, well, that's nothing. Yeah, you just go find one venture capitalist, you get it done. I'm like, that's not really how it works in Boise. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to raise it in increments of $25,000. So, I mean, full disclosure, I've I'm, I've signed on as an executive producer on this film, not because I intend to make any money, because we're not going to make any money, because I want to support someone like Zach, who's doing great art. And as Tony Dorr said last night, the, the product's going to be great, and it's going to go to film festivals, and it's going to be seen by hundreds of thousands of people, and we will make money, sure, but I support Zach because the, the art is the process. Living in this community and making this film the film has to do with uh, just food culture, I'll say, and biking. What a better film to illustrate Boise. And again, I'm in full support of the Buffer Bike Lanes. We can argue that later off camera if you want. But, you know, what if, what if this film was the representation of Boise, Idaho in 2014 and really captured the zeitgeist of this community? Don't we want to support that? Don't we want to put that out in the world? And so again, I talk all the time about Boise when I'm out there lecturing in the world because it blows people's minds. First of all, that it's hard, like, yeah. Well, someone said to me the other day, well, studies, statistics show that most films, independent films, won't do well unless they have a budget of five million plus. So y'all really should have a five million plus budget. I'm like, yeah, we should. <laughs> <laughs> but you're looking at it from a top-down sort of MBA perspective. This isn't about just getting a bunch of money. This is about building a film that's a value to this community, that represents who we are, that shows the best of us. Noted, there's a noted psychologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. He's uh, very renowned. He's written a lot of books, one called Creativity, one called Flow. And he talks about flow as being this optimal state. And if you're lucky enough to experience it in your life or daily, it's the optimal state where what you're doing, you lose sense of, you know, time or, or uh, you lose that inner critic that's always alive inside of you. And you're able to just delve right in. So athletes talk about it a lot. You know, I'm a member of the group The Gang, which Nancy Napier here at BSU organizes. And it was Coach Pete, myself, Don Kemper, um, Jamie Cooper, the sheriff. Bob Locke and a bunch of us, and we get together from these disparate, uh, Mark Hoffman from Shakespeare, Rich Ramondi, and people from these disparate you know, fields, disparate domains, right? But we would talk about our similarities, and we talk about Boise, and we talk about the things that, that matter. And we talk about creativity a lot of the time, because Nancy would push it, you know, because she runs the Center for Creativity and Innovation here at Kobe. But she would say, you're all creative. And the criteria she used for the gang was local organizations that are successful and innovative. And it was interesting to get a football coach, a ballet dancer, a sheriff, and a tech guy and a, you know, in the same room. And what we would realize is we share 90% of the same process. The only things that are really different are just the, the logistics of our domain. So noted psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi talks a lot about flow. And we talk a lot about that. We didn't really use that word. But it's the same for, it was, it was the same for Coach Pete as it is for a dancer at TMP as it is for an actor at Shakespeare. That all makes sense, sort of performative. But it turns out it's the same for someone who's writing code. Hmm. That you want to enter this state where you're just, you're channeling the unknown, right? So what is creativity? A lot of people say it's a lot of things. It's a big bucket word. I think creativity is the balance of form and feeling. It's the balance of the known and the unknown. A lot's been written about this. It's that rub of everything you know, everything that came before, you, all the training you've had, the form, the years you spent building your skill. And you, know, you go to universities like this to learn a trade, to learn a skill. That's all great. 
But then you get to that point where you are, to some degree, a master of your domain. You know what you're doing, but you readily accept there's so much you don't know. And that's a good thing, to make yourself vulnerable, to start over every day. As a ballet dancer, you have this brilliant performance the night before, and the next day you walk in, and the first thing you do is hold on to the bar and stand in first position and do a plie. You do a bend. Plie means to bend. And you start over. You can't, come back, you can't come in the next day and say, I was brilliant last night. I'm going to skip the warm-up today because I'm just going to do what I did last night. If I came in right now today and was like, I don't know, I've given a similar speech a hundred thousand times. I'm just going to nail this. No, you have to make yourself vulnerable. You have to start over. To me, the creative process is the process of, of accepting what you don't know and, and accepting what you do know and challenging yourself to stay in that place of ambiguity constantly. Often out of necessity, you, my nonprofit brethren, have to live there as well. Constantly in a place of ambiguity, constantly in a place of discomfort. It doesn't feel good, but that's where a lot of innovation happens. That's where a lot of things happen. That's where a lot of new ideas occur. That's where new relationships are formed. Again, often out of necessity. I have a friend recently who um, came into a lot of money. And he was saying, it's really hard because I have so many options now. It was actually easier when I didn't have this great wealth. I think there's something beautiful about the fact that nonprofits are strapped for cash. It's, it really sucks. It's hard. <laughs> you don't pay people what they're worth. You lose that one major patron, and you just think the world's going to end. And then you find a new major patron. Or, even better, you find 50 new patrons that make up for that one patron that went away. You don't get a grant one year and you are so angry and you just think about all the time you spent drafting that grant and how wasted that time was. And then you realize the ideas that you developed building that grant change your perspective. And then you build a new program even though you didn't get the money. And then you get the money because you inspire someone because you build a program that's of great value. Back to Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. He writes a lot about flow, but he also writes about creativity, and he says, a creative person is someone that changes the domain. But that change is not affected until it's recognized by the field. Trey McIntyre Project changed the domain of what it means to be a dance company. And we knew we were doing cool stuff here in Boise, but it wasn't accepted by the field until the New York Times twice came and did a cover story on us, or PBS NewsHour came and did a story. Press is good, right? We all know it's good, and it helps you do things, it helps you tell these stories, and they never get it right. Those stories weren't accurate, and in fact, one of them really pissed me off because it made Boise seem like this little town that worships at the altar of TMP. I said, no, you completely missed the point. But once those stories got out in the world, dance companies began to pay attention, and people began to shift their practice. So again, he says, a creative person is someone that changes the domain, but that change is not recognized, or is not affected until it's recognized by the few. We talk a lot about Boise and the gang. We talk about all the things that we always talk about when we talk about Boise, right? Most isolated urban area in the continental United States, which leads to, I think, great innovative practice happening here. We're not always just copying what's happening in the next city over. We're having to make things up. We talk about work-life balance. We talk about connection to nature. We talk a lot about generosity. Generosity of spirit. Generosity of time and finances. But just generosity. Again, walking down the street, you're going to say hey to people you don't know, and you're going to say hey to the other 93 people you do know. We start to talk a lot about the brand of Boise, for lack of a better word. So this is the moment where I start to talk about the call to arms. What are we? What is Boise? Those of us that live here choose to live here. There's a lot of people who are born in Idaho and choose to stay here. There's a lot of people who move away and come back, especially when it's time to raise a family, because they know this is the community they want to be in. 
There's a lot of you, like myself, who chose to be here. And it would have made more sense to go someplace else, according to all the bottom line metrics. But we were paying attention to the third metric. We were paying attention to the triple, paying attention to the triple bottom line. Or I, as I think about it, we were paying attention to also, I think a lot of us want to live in a creative way, whether we know it or not. A lot of people balk a little bit when you tell them they're creative. What is that? What is, creative? what is the creative process? I think it's that process of starting over. I think it's that process of staying humble. I think it's that process of waking up every day and asking yourself first the question of why. I don't mean why me, but why. Why am I here? Why am I here right now? What's my place in the world? And I find a lot of people in Boise, whether they consciously do it or not, ask themselves that question. They stay in a place of curiosity. They stay in a place of sometimes discomfort. Again, not out of choice, but sometimes out of necessity. <coughs> but I find people in Boise stay in a really lovely zone, that, in that middle zone, in the balance of form and feeling. They know what they know. They're confident, but they're also very quick to, to accept something that's unknown. They were willing to take a chance on a dance company. They are willing to take a chance on a lot of the nonprofits here in this room. I'm doing a research project now with a faculty member at the University of Chicago, and he's doing a, a study on wisdom. The, the dictionary defines wisdom as judgment, and that's not really a good definition, so he wants to find the real meaning of wisdom. So you could argue wisdom is experience mixed with knowledge, which is form mixed with form, if you ask me, you know. What you know, what, plus what you know, you get wisdom. It doesn't really work, because there's plenty of people who have lots of experience and lots of knowledge, and they're not wise. So he heard about my project, and so we've sort of combined forces, because maybe creativity or the creative process is that other element that makes up wisdom. Experience plus knowledge, plus the ability to iterate, to create new ideas, but even more so to listen. People in nonprofits know how to listen. They're not always telling. They're not always saying, this is good for you and you need to do this, and we've got market shares, so you know, we're going to make this happen. They don't have financial assets just to make whatever they want happen. They have to build relationships, they have to build collaborations, they have to listen, they have to really understand what matters to their community, to themselves, and they have to devise a path that's often evolving as they're taking each step. So another analogy I use for the creative process is having one foot on terra firma, on everything you know, and constantly, constantly stepping out into that abyss, challenging yourself to not ever just put two feet on the ground and be where you are, that's not creativity. If you do that, the world's going to keep evolving and moving and you're going to be in one place. How do you keep challenging yourself to change, to evolve, to have a personal creative process? And then when you understand, as my dad would say, know who you are, know what you want, and you have your personal creative process, how do you then share that with the world? How do you then create programs that involve others? and build ways of engaging the community and the world around you. So back to the game, we talked a lot about the brand of Boise. What are we right now? What is this community? Now I'll speak bluntly, I think Boise has a window of time right now in which it can define itself as something great. We don't want to be the next Denver. We don't want to be the next Portland even. We want, to be, we want to leapfrog ahead and position ourselves in the world as something new that we haven't seen. And to me, the main way to do that is by exercising this uniqueness that's here. When TMP was touring through Asia, the Deputy Secretary of State, Ann Stock, said, what you're doing is really special, but you have to name it and claim it. I don't think Boise is naming it and claiming it enough right now. I don't think we are really galvanizing our best and, and utilizing our best assets. As we all know, our best assets are no longer Fortune 500 companies. Our best assets are no longer, even though it's great, 
we have great work-life balance, we have great connection to nature, we need to continue building those infrastructures, adding bike lanes, developing the green belt, you know, keeping the foothills protected. But a lot of cities are doing that. So if we're going to be sort of trying to differentiate and compare ourselves to other cities, we have to really state the things that make us unique and special. We have to really state the aspects of ourselves that are not replicable in any other community. And that, those assets are the nonprofits in this room. They're the people who are making this community unique. They're building awareness, they're listening, they're building connections, and they're building an understanding of what it means to be a Boisean. The James L. and John S. Knight Foundation did a recent study of, I think, 20 American cities, something like that. And it was, they, they had people rate 20 factors, 20 factors of why they live in a city. And they did this study three or four times, and culture was always number one. Now, is it culture with a capital C or culture with a lowercase c? Is there any difference? But culture, that means we have a lot of pride in our Basque culture. Most of us aren't Basque, but we still like that we have a Basque culture here. And we go to the Basque block, and we eat the food, and we go to High Aldi. Or another really emotional, weepy moment for myself when I think back on the history of TMP was performing at High Aldi. Trey McIntyre Project was the first non-Basque organization asked to participate in the festival. And Trey created a work honoring Boise's Basque culture. And the, the roar of the audience one minute into the piece, when we did the, I forget the Basque word, when we did the flag movement, where the, all the, everyone drops and one person waves a flag over their heads, it was astounding. And then we thought, well, that's great, of course they're going to like it, they're Basque. <laughs> but when we, when we take it on tour, maybe it's too esoteric, people won't get it. It was probably the most positively reviewed piece of dance ever given by Alistair McCauley, the chief dance critic for the New York Times. He loved it because it was about something. It was about a very unique subculture that was you know, interesting, sort of a novelty, but also Trey and the dancers and all of TMP spent a lot of time really getting to know this interesting Basque community. <coughs> we took dance lessons, we ate their food, we interacted, we, we, we became part of that community. And that was a powerful moment, but the more powerful moment was later that night on the Basque block. And as you know, High Aldi gets a little raucous, right? <laughs> and they do a dance called Sortsiko, where one at a time, two men get in the middle and they do the high kicks. And so we've been training in this dance, you know, for a year. They threw us in. We were one of the Basque people. All the Ankadi dancers grabbed us and said, you know, this is your moment. And we were in there in the middle of the Basque block doing our kicks. So I think back on that also and think that's, you know, that's why I'm still here. Culture defines a community. Every city in America is saying, we have a unique culture. We have great work-life balance. We have nature. We have tax incentives. We have all these things. But I really think that Boise has something different. I think it has some assets that other cities don't have. And a lot of that is this creative process that I'm beginning to try to illuminate. It's the way you go about living your life. It's the micro choices you make for yourself and then how you share them with the world around you. And that's the leg up that we have in Boise. You're able to share your way of life and your way of being with so many more people in your community. I'm able to, most of us in this room, right, you're able to pick up the phone or grab someone if you need them. You have access, you're able to make impact. And you're able to share these memes, these ideas. Again, as I'm judging these social new venture challenges and people are thinking it's so great, this social impact idea, I just keep thinking, but nonprofits have been doing that forever. We are thought developers. We are creative. We are developing new ways for the future. We're creating new memes. Art is research and development for the future. It's creating new ways of understanding the world around us that eventually are embraced by the populace. Here in Boise, we have such access to incredible talent. We talk a lot about, though, we don't have the skills we need, that we don't have enough, you know, working with 
Ryan Woodings and MetaGeek and putting Hackfort together, and working with Tim at White Cloud, you know, what we heard a lot is we don't have some of the tech talent we need. Some of the front end and back end designers. They're not choosing Boise because they're going to other cities. Something like, and I might butcher this, Tim, but something like 90% of computer science grads from University of Idaho leave the state. Something like that. Why? I think that we have a moment right now, a window, and I will put our feet to the fire and say that if we don't utilize this window, it will pass us. But I think we have a window coming up in which we have to, for lack of a better word, develop the brand of Boise. And I don't mean a logo and a slogan. I mean, we have to name it and claim it. We have to state this is our culture. And it is unique in these ways, and it is different than any other city in these ways, and it's the people in this room that make up that culture. It's the nonprofits and the people that are working with that third metric, with that triple bottom line, and with a creative process that are ultimately exhibiting wisdom. And I think there's a wisdom in this community, and there's also a naivete. Because real innovation happens at that balance of being a master of something, but also staying very humble and saying, I don't know. And that's a really beautiful thing. So I continue to make my home here because I've been in Chicago for five weeks. And I'm talking about all sorts of stuff and being very busy and attending this gala and doing that. And, and then I get to come home to Boise and I just get to be. Right? But even within being, I'm still active. I'm here talking to you today, but this doesn't feel like I'm doing something. This just feels like I get to be here with you. It's not the same in a lot of other cities. You're proving yourself by your accomplishments. You're proving yourself by what you do. You're proving yourself by your successes. I think we evaluate people, we, each other. I think we, for lack of a better word, we judge each other by how you are, how you are, how you come as you are how you're being with us. I think there's something really beautiful. And I think we have to better state it. And then for those of you who are in the room who do, are able to appropriate money, if you work for a corporation, really think a lot about how you're investing in this community. What's the money you're using for career, uh, employee development? What's the money you're using for economic development? For and then triple it and give it to the nonprofits in your community. I am a fan of philanthropy, but I'm more a fan of recognizing that there is utility in this creative process. It is not beautification. It is not just value added. It's value. And without it, we are different. We are no different than any other community. The truth of it is, a lot of for-profits are interchangeable. You could be in any city. A beautiful thing about a lot of for-profits in Boise is you are about this community. Bank of the Cascades is incredibly dedicated to this community. So how do we continue to develop and prove that? We have to put, yes, financial investment behind what's going on. And I think the challenge is we have to greatly increase it. We need to fund Zach's film. We need to ensure that Tree Fort Music Fest happens next year and the year after and the year after. We have to make sure that new creative endeavors like Momenta and the institutions are here forever. We have to make sure the WCA thrives. We have to make sure that, I mean, Jim doesn't need any help with the YMCA, but he does. <laughs> we have to make sure that there's more kids going to camp and there's more scholarships. And I'm sure Jim's got another capital campaign cooking somewhere. But, we have, but that defines us, these experiences. So the call to arms is vague at this moment, but I want you to think about your own creative process, what matters to you, ask that question of why, Think about what you know. Think about how you challenge yourself to step into the unknown. And then think about how we're going to share that collectively and what needs to happen, seriously happen in the next year. And as much as I love the mayor and city council, it's not going to come from them. It's going to come from this community. How are we going to put a lot of money behind some things that need to happen? But how are we also going to better state to the world the utility of our creative process? So thank you again for having me. It's good to see a lot of you. It's been a while. Thank you.